Clemson is in western South Carolina, and it's underlain by the Piedmont Aquifer System. This map is the map of the um, principal aquifers of the U.S. You can get more information about it here at the Groundwater Atlas. This is a great resource for the hydrogeology of the U.S., and here is the, the website. But if you just search for um, Groundwater Atlas, you'll get there. So the Piedmont Aquifer System occupies this region here. And if you, move, if you go towards the coast, you get into the coastal plain. If you go inland, you go across the Appalachians and then into the Appalachian Basin. And you get then into some limestones here. Mammoth Cave is right about here in this purple Mississippian limestone. If we look at this area in a little more detail, here's Clemson right here in this dot. And here's Anderson down here about 20 miles away to give you an idea about the scale. And you can see the structural grain trending roughly north 30 east like this. These different color bands of, uh, of rock on the map are high-grade metamorphic rocks. They're separated by um, thrust faults in some cases, and they're uh, highly folded into naps. And in general, they're gneisses and schists. Clemson itself is underlain by biotite gneiss, and that's this purple unit here. And this unit here to the southeast is a granitoid gneiss. We can also see this yellow pattern. This is alluvium along the streams. So the bedrock is fractured crystalline rock, these high-grade metamorphic gneisses and schists. This is, a, uh, this is actually a, a, an outcrop in Atlanta, but the rock type is similar, and you can see this uh, large subhorizontal, very prominent fracture. Here's a vertical fracture. Um, these are the these fractures form the flow system in the uh, fractured rock in the subsurface. And here's a quarry, and many of these fractures were created by blasting, but some of them, like probably this one here, are natural. And you can see water seeping out of this one. That's how water is transmitted through the bedrock. This is a close-up of a fracture in some granite. This is near El El Elberton, Georgia. And you can see the open space along this very simple fracture. So the conceptual model of just a plug down through the, well, this would be down through a stream. There are a variety of versions of it, but they share some common traits. and. One of them is, well, we see here um, some fractures and uh, some flat-lying fractures and steeply dipping fractures. So this is the, this fractured metamorphic rock. And it's generally unweathered, but then as you go to shallower depths, you transition into some highly weathered rock called saprolite or residuum. That's this stuff up here. And there's a transition zone from the fractured rock that's generally unweathered down here at depth to this highly weathered saprolite. And the water table is right here in the saprolite. So here are the three zones that are typically recognized. The saprolite, the fractured metamorphic rock, and igneous rock in some places, and then this transition zone between them. So the saprolite forms an important role in the hydrogeology around here. And we can see this is, uh, these are some pictures of some folded high-grade metamorphic rocks. Here's another photograph, and you can see some uh, very um, prominent folds. And then this is a picture of saprolite in the vicinity of Clemson, and you can see that there's similar folds developed in, in this material, like that. And here's some the layering here, so there's some kind of fault in there. Um, and the difference is, though, that this stuff up here is uh, is hard resistant rock. You hit it with a hammer, and and you can tell that it's a uh, very resistant material. But this is saprolite down here, and uh, to form this exposure that that we photograph here, we just uh, dug it out with a, a shovel and a hoe. It's very weak, very easily um, dug out material. 
So the, the saprolite, it shares the fabric of the parent metamorphic rock, but it's been completely altered. The, the mineralogy is different, and the uh, strength of it is completely different. It's completely, um, it, it, it's very low strength at this point. So here's what happens. The weathering process um, causes this profound change in the, the rock. And the, the rocks around here are primarily feldspar, biotite, and quartz. And here's a picture of a granite that has a similar mineralogy. And we can think of that as something like this, where these are the, these are the feldspars, here's some quartz, and then the, the biotite is, is in between. And during the weathering process, the feldspar weathers to clay, and the biotite will weather to iron oxide and clay. And the quartz doesn't really weather much. And so during the weathering process, what happens is these feldspars uh, in the in the, the fresh rock, the feldspars are a strong mineral, and they they give the rock a, a very high strength. But once they weather, they they weather clay, and the the um, the structural backbone of the rock is just completely disintegrated because now once these feldspars weather and and the bithite weathers as well, um, even though the quartz is intact. Uh, this is essentially um, clay minerals and and other uh, weathering process products, and and some of the material just simply um, weathers and dissolves and and washes away. Uh, it's dissolved away, and so what you end up with is a very high por high porosity material um, that is very structurally structurally weak because of this change from largely uh, the change from feldspar to clay so this is the um, kind of properties that you expect in um, in this area so the, here's porosity as a function of depth and I put on here the, the saprolite and then this transition zone and down here into the rock and what you see is that in the saprolite, you have porosities up in this range. And this is the 40 to 50% range. So that's quite high porosity. And the, the transition zone has a similar porosity. But then once you get down into the fractured rock, the porosity is down here in just a few percent. So the hydraulic conductivity, this plot is a plot uh, generated by Malcolm Schaefer. And he studied. Uh, several sites in this area. These are the the different sites, and um, characterize the hydraulic conductivity as a function of depth and and as a function of location within this conceptual model. So these data here are in the transition zone, and this is up in the saprolite, and this is then down in the rock. And you can see that there's a good bit of scatter. This is on a log plot, um, but in general the transition zone seems to be uh, a bit higher in hydraulic conductivity than the saprolite and the, and the rock by by perhaps on average say half an order of magnitude uh, the 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 general range is 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 5 uh, meters per second for the hydraulic conductivity that should be large k capital k Okay, so here's a summary of the properties. The hydraulic conductivity, uh, this is the range 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6 meters per second. And then uh, we've been using feet per minute, so that's the range approximately in, in feet per minute. Um, if you look at the hydraulic conductivity of the intact rock, the unweathered, unfractured rock, it's in this range. So five or six orders of magnitude, um, say about five orders of magnitude different. So the fracturing process is responsible for this large change in the hydraulic conductivity. And this is typically the uh, transmissivity that's recognized for this region. And if we do a, a conversion, this is in uh, it's 10 to 100 meters squared per day. And if we do a conversion, we get this range in feet squared per minute. And this is about the range that we were seeing in, in our tests at the well field. And these are some other 
characteristics, the recharge, and the well, well yield that are typically recognized for this area. So we took a vertical slice in, the, in a, a few slides ago to, as far as the conceptual model, but here we can broaden out and look at the landscape itself. So we have the, the stream here, and here's the uplands, and the saprolite, it's called regolith in this slide, that's another name for the saprolite. And here's the fractured rock down here with these horizontal fractures, subhorizontal, and some steeply dipping fractures. And this is the transition zone between the unweathered rock and the highly weathered saprolite. And we also see some a vertical fracture zone here uh, with the stream localized in that zone. And some typical dimensions. Uh, the saprolite is typically say 50 feet thick but it can be variable up to 100 feet thick is uh, is fairly common the water table is about 20 to 60 feet down at the lower well field it was about 25 feet down and the upper well field it was more like 45 feet uh, fracture zones in the valleys and and a combination of some vertical fractures and flat line fractures uh, in the rock that'll give us a connected flow system. Oh, and one more thing. The water table, typically we think of the water table as being up in the saprolite. So the other thing that is typical for the water sh or for the groundwater sheds around here is that they form local flow systems. And what that means is that the recharge to the, to the aquifer will typically go and discharge to the nearest stream. So if this is a landscape and this is a, a, a topographic divide, and we'll just assume that this is also a groundwater divide, then recharge that comes in at that point is going to go and, and discharge to that stream. And maybe up here it's going to go down to that stream. Here it'll go like that and then recharge over here, it's going to go and discharge to this stream. And so there's a groundwater divide that separates these two flow systems. And so that then allows us to go and take this conceptual model and draw some flow lines in cross-section. So here's what we've got. This is the, the ground surface, and here's the, here's the Vado zone, and we generally expect the water to flow roughly vertically downward through the Vado zone and then it reaches the water table here in the saprolite here's the fractured rock down at depth and this is the transition zone and so the flow lines in this conceptual model go like this um, vertically downward through the saprolite uh, in this case and then along this transition zone Remember, there's some evidence that this is a little bit higher hydraulic connectivity. So we, we, we channel the flow through this zone, and it discharges to the stream. We have a flow, flow pass that looks like that when we get closer to the stream. In some cases, we have recharge, though, that goes down through the saprolite, gets into the fracture rock, and we have a flow path that looks like that. Hydraulic heads up here in the uplands. We've got the head differences like this, indicating a high head at shallow depths, low head at greater depths, and a downward flow. Here we've got, near the streams, we've got a, a piezometer that gives us heads that are above the stream. So that must mean that the heads here are greater than the stream, so that would indicate an upward flow. So this is just a general conceptual model. In, in many places, it can be different than this. Um, but this is a good guideline uh, for a place to start when you're thinking about what, the, what to expect at a particular location in the Piedmont. So one thing that's also good to keep in mind is that these fracture systems, typically the way they're regarded is that, that they're the fracture systems are form these interconnected networks of finite size. And so this shows the fracture, uh, an interconnected zone of fractures here is this uh, purple color that are intersected by these wells. 
And that shows the extent of this interconnected fracture zone. And these other colored zones are also other interconnected fracture zones that have a finite size and that aren't connected to each other. And so these are the, the kind of the hydrologic flow units that are typically recognized to occur in uh, fractured crystalline rock. Okay, so that's that's the flow system for the most part, but you did notice that there there is some alluvium along the streams around here. Now it's important to recognize that the alluvium along the streams around here is much less. It's a, a much smaller, much more poorly developed than alluvium further to the north and also further to the west. In those areas, the climatic conditions um, and, and also the um, flows resulting from the melting of the glaciers were, were very high and carried a lot of sand and created some very well-developed large um, sand alluvial aquifers. And down here, it's much more poorly developed, but nevertheless, there are sand and gravel aquifers associated with the alluvial systems around here. And it's worth noting, particularly because we were working with one of them at the bottoms well field. And w during our next exercise at Fance Grove, we'll probably encounter um, some more sand uh, aquifers in an alluvial system. So let's take a quick look. The conceptual model for an alluvial aquifer, this is uh, a major uh, alluvial aquifer. And um, what we've got here is, is a major, major river. And so there's this meander belt um, that, the, that the major river is, is taking. Uh, there are some oxbow lakes, and this will be important because this will be a place where we could have some clays deposited. And then once we get out from this meander belt, out here, this is the floodplain. And so the, the, the significant thing is that um, while this r river is... Uh, well, this river is reworking sediments. Uh, it's capable of carrying some some coarse grain material, so we might expect to find some coarse grain material associated with the river channel. Where the channel gets cut off, though, we could have some oxbows, oxbow lakes formed. And then out here, away from the channel, this floods every once in a while. And when it does, it's far from the main channel, so the energy is fairly low, and this will deposit fairly fine grain materials. And so out here, the floodplain has um, silts and uh, can be really quite fine grain. Now, all of this system here is overlying a coarser grain system. It's called the substratum here. And uh, this is the uh, coarse alluvial aquifer resting on bedrock. So this is the primary target for um, for water supplies. And this material up here, the floodplain deposits, uh, particularly over here, fairly fine grain. And so you can have a confined aquifer formed here. Uh, if we put a well in here, it would behave like a confined aquifer. Here, if, there's, uh, if, if these are sands or relatively coarse material, this behave, might behave more like an unconfined aquifer. Um, and we have some, some tributaries coming in from the side. Uh, in this case, we have, well, this is showing a stream that comes in and then just dies out. And what's happening here is that this tributary comes in and it flows across the floodplain and it's losing here. And so it, it loses as it flows along the floodplain and it never makes it to the main, the main channel. In other cases, you have tributaries, though, that have more flow or go over lower permeability material, and they, they in fact, can make it to the, the major river. So this losing tributary is also something to keep in mind. So there's the different regions. Also, in some cases, um, there are terrace deposits formed as the river um, builds up and then cuts down the, uh, it'll leave behind terraces. 
Okay, so this is this is developed for major alluvial aquifers up north and in, in the west, but this is probably a reasonable um, ex, a, a reasonable conceptual model uh, if we scale it down for the alluvial aquifer in the bottoms. Okay, so here's a uh, alluvial um, sedimentary rock in Texas. And one thing I just want to point out here is these things here, these are the sand deposits. And so the way these systems work is that they, they leave the alluvial systems, um, particularly this one, it's a, it's a braided, um, braided type of type system. And there are, there are many channels, many discontinuous uh, sand bodies that are kind of scattered through this thing. And so we might expect that we might expect similar kinds of things where there are sand deposits in these uh, alluvial systems that are somewhat discontinuous. Okay, so here's the bottoms, and the well field that we were working in is right here. And you can see this is the Seneca River. And this is Lake Hartwell out here. This is a this is a dike, and another dike that was. These were built to hold back the lake because this area is lower than the lake. And so, what's going on here is that we have a floodplain, and we've got some of the uplands that are uh, the regular Piedmont system. And so the green here is the the Piedmont. So this is the, the fractured crystalline rock overlain by saprolite. And this is the floodplain. And here's the, the Seneca River. So the Seneca River, it went out like this and out like this. And it was cut off by these two dikes when they built the lake. But what we see here is a meandering system. Clearly, this is a meandering river. Um, this was the, the floodplain, and that's, there's a kilometer, so it's about half a kilometer wide. And this whole region here is floodplain. And apparently what happened is the, the river was, the river would meander around like this. In fact, we've done some work down here uh, at this end of the bottoms. And there's some coarse gravel there that was apparently left behind by this uh, channel when it meandered over there. Okay, so this is the Seneca River, this meandering system, um, and it formed a, a fairly, fairly good, 10 foot thick anyway, uh, alluvial aquifer. And we're fairly familiar with this, I think, at this point. Here's another area. This is south of Clemson. This is the Fance Grove area. And um, it consists of upland areas. So this is saprolite. The Tri-County Tech is right up, right about here. And um, this is the Garrison Arena, and this is Route 76. So it, Route 76 crosses 18 Mile Creek right here, and this line right here, this, this this tree line is 18 Mile Creek. So the area that's not green is the floodplain for 18 Mile Creek. There's the floodplain. And here's 18 Mile Creek. And this is the scale. So the width of this here, say, is a, a, a couple hundred meters. So it's a bit thinner than so the Seneca River floodplain. 18 Mile Creek is also a, a smaller stream than the Seneca River. But the other thing that's really noticeable here is that this stream is not meandering at all. And it's just, it's just straight as can be. And the reason for this is that the, the stream long ago was, uh, was straightened and put in dikes. So there's a, there's a dike along here and along here. And that causes the stream to follow this straight course. Sometimes during floods, it'll break out, and this area will will periodically flood. Um, but but generally, the stream just um, does what it's told and stays within this dike and just runs this straight course. 
What's left behind, though, is this alluvial system, these sediments here, that are relics of um, the, the previous deposition. And so we'll take a look at this, and we'll um, do some sampling and some characterization of this area. One thing that you should keep in mind is that you can see the floodplain is like so, and it's about a constant width until we get right down here to this point. And right here, this is this is the contact with the crystalline crystalline basement rock, and you can see it gets quite narrow here. Um, there's a little bit of alluvium here right along the stream, but the the crystalline rock gets to be quite narrow. And in fact, this is where the the bridge is put. So the bridge is the bridge is here because they can build the bridge on some good um, sturdy crystalline rock instead of these uh, the alluvial materials and this also may have played a role in the deposition of the sediments in this uh, alluvial system here because this is this is going to be a choke point while when the sediments were deposited and when we're out here taking a look around we'll notice how the sediment changes as we go from from up here to, to down here below this choke point